So today, as we are recording this episode live um, on April 7th, though it's going to air in a, in a few weeks after this, do you feel that the rebound that's happening in the world right now is real? And for those to give you a context, we're talking about the virus, COVID-19, and everything that's going on with the world. And there's been some positive news lately. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I think this is a practice for all of us in patience. This is a practice for all of us in learning to control what we can control and let go of everything else. You know, is, is it turning? Maybe. Um, but I think what we've got to do is, you know, I was on a call the other day with an NFL coaching staff team and, and I said, look, I mean, if you're an NFL team right now and you're waiting for all of this to flip and then you're going to start preparing for the season and then you're going to start getting your guys ready mentally and physically, you're not going to have a great season, right? Like you have to reframe this moment and this window of time as a window of time in which you can either choose to look back at it and say, man, I took advantage of that or you know, I, I didn't lean into it like I could have. And, and for all of us, it's different, right? I mean, some people are trying to truly survive. Some people yeah. are trying to decide whether to lay people off. Some people are trying to decide how to pivot their business. I mean, everybody's sort of survival is, is different, certainly. Um, but it's an absolute practice in controlling the controllables in, in, this, in this environment, for sure. Very well said. And for everybody tuning in, be sure to, so you can put a face to the name. If you're listening to one of the podcast platforms today, we have Molly Fletcher. Thanks so much for being on. Everybody, please go on mollyfletcher.com. And that's on your website, right? You have the links to all your major social media platforms, your YouTube, um, your, your very, your, and your podcast as well. Sure, um, sure. You're, you're out there and, and any, wherever I guess I was looking, I found you and I came across Molly Aww, Fletcher, as well as, cool. as well as your books that you've written. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely uh, current world issues have kind of hijacked what's going on and what's being talked about, but rightfully so. Like, I feel like it would be uh, not, not right right now to not address these issues. Yeah. And being, being a you know, keynote speaker, uh, dealing with, with performance, and you were just saying you're talking with an NFL team, uh, this is, how has this affected you and, and your business? Well, I mean, it's funny when somebody asked me that the other day, a friend said, you know, asked me that question. I said, well, I don't know. I make a living getting on airplanes, flying and speaking at large events. So, <laughs> you know, it, uh, yeah. it, it impacted it significantly from the perspective that I speak generally 60 times a year to audiences of 500 to a thousand plus. Mm -hmm. So all of those are being moved around, rescheduled um, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, from that perspective, it did. Um, but in some regards, I think, you know, like I was, you know, I think you've got to look at all the gifts in this and say, look, I've just been gifted this one year sabbatical, you know, to, to create uh, new content, um, to lean into maybe creating new products, to nurture my team, um, to pour into them, to invest in them. Um, you know, to, 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 to think about all the things that we want to do, but sometimes we don't have time to do. Mm -hmm. Now you have the bandwidth to potentially do it. Um, you have the bandwidth to pour into relationships that you often don't have time to pour into. Yes. Um, yes. you know, and I say all that while I'm hemorrhaging cash, <laughs> right? Where there is no particularly, uh, significant inflows. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that like, like anything in life, right? I mean, you, you've, you've got to prepare for these moments. Unfortunately we have, and so we can weather this storm and, and uh, you know, hopefully come out stronger. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll see that, you know, we'll see, we'll sadly see some companies uh, struggle and, but maybe we'll see some come out stronger and, you know, that's, that's what we've got to lean into. You were mentioning, uh, you know, hemorrhaging cash right now. And I, if this is, if you don't feel comfortable answering this, let me know. But did you have to lay people off? No, I haven't. You know, I have a small team of four people okay. and uh, I love my team um, a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of in the long game here. This will turn. And I love the people that are on this bus with me. And I want to keep them on the bus. And they're people first who happen to be an amazing part of our company. But um, they're people with families and hearts and souls, and I need to be empathetic 
you know, to that and, uh, you know, pour into them as much as I can and, and while making good, strong business decisions, but, yes. um, no, I, I, I fortunately am, am not going to need to do that, which, which is huge. Cause yeah. I, you know, I, I and, and I know there's a lot of organizations that feel the way I feel about their team, but maybe they're in a different spot or, you know, they're owned by someone else or they don't have the ability to make those kinds of decisions. And I know that's just horrible and horrifying, but I think, I'm fortunate to have a small team and so I can navigate it. But I also think, you know, it's about leaning into them and saying, hey, look, you know, all of our roles have changed. You know, normally I'm speaking two times a week. You know, I'm not doing that. Normally they're booking ground transportation for me when I'm speaking. They're navigating hotels. They're sending PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. They're helping draft keynotes. They're scheduling pre-calls with keynotes that I'm delivering. You know, we deliver workshops all over the country um, on negotiation training. Normally my events team is sort of executing against those. All that. Uh, um, has changed a little bit. We're still delivering some things virtually. I'm doing some virtual keynotes. I'm yeah. doing some virtual training. Oh, that's good. Um, so, but the, but that's pivoted. So I think you know the question that you ask yourself as an organization is, you know, it, it, here we've been gifted this sabbatical at some level for for a year. We can still serve our customers uh, virtually, which is fantastic for the ones that that want to lean into that. But you know. How, how can, what are the, based on the fact that your job description has changed, what are the three to five things that you can, as a teammate, lean into, um, pivot and serve the organization? So that's what I'm challenging my people to do, right? Mm -hmm. is, is your job has changed. So what was your job description, you know, four months ago? It, it, it's different now. So Crazy. write, write it, mm -hmm. lean into it. Um, and be creative because that's how I believe in the world that we're in right now and the environment that we're in. People can stay safe, hopefully in their environments, is to try to find ways to add value. Now, again, that's different for every organization. You know, some organizations, it's just, it's just different. But there's lots of things that we have in, in my own business that are gaps. So as a team, it's like lean into those, identify what those are and solve and serve for those. Um, and, and so that's hopefully what, what we're trying to do, but it's different for everybody. So I'm not suggesting that my, 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 you know, path is the right path. Yeah. It's just the path that we're choosing to take, but everybody's in a different situation. And do you like for other people out there that make their money, you know, mainly through the being at events, running events, speaking at events, like, do you think that they need to be pivoting right now to going more digital? Like, is this something now that we're probably that's probably going to be with us for the long haul or is a chance no, I, is there a chance we'll be talking you know doing 40 50 000 person things events anytime soon yeah i mean I, I i certainly don't have a crystal ball i don't know i mean i think you'll see different organizations handle it all differently right um yeah. you know i think you'll see organizations that lean into the digital play and go my man this is a less expensive this is better yeah uh this works equally as well our results are are you know the metrics against this are are, are equal or, or better and we're spending less money. And so we're going to lean into this moving forward. And, and then I think you're going to see more than not most people saying, I want to get my people together. I mean, they're, you know, we as human beings, we've known this for hundreds of years. We love to be with each other. That's mm -hmm. what makes this whole thing so hard is we all love to be with each other. And there's no better way to do that than, being physically together. Um, so I, I think that, no, I don't think large events are absolutely not. I think they'll absolutely exist okay. for, you know, eight out of 10 organizations. I think there may be two out of 10 that say, man, this digital thing's working or they're in a financial situation where they need to restructure the way they spend against these large events and they're expensive to execute. So, you know, they may pivot. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't see it going away in the long haul for sure. Cause it's a scary it's thought, right? Either. Well, it's a scary thought that like right now we're already attached to our phones, our iPads, whatever you name yeah. it. Well, let's just yeah. add, add this scare component to it and let's start going fully all digital. Like uh, are yeah. we due? It sounds like we're doomed as uh, you know, as humanity here. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's just, there's so much power in human connection. And I think when you look back at historically human, human beings and mankind, we need it. We all need it. We do. So we do. And for those listening that, you know, unfortunately have hit the hard times where 
they did lose their jobs. I have numerous friends that that have, and yeah. and it's yeah. not com- It's not certain that they'll ever get them back. For example, yeah. the fitness industry. You know, things are definitely ah. gonna get rattled up in that one big time. Um, how does someone like that that's done one thing their whole entire life? What do they do now? Like if say their gym got shut down? Yeah, I'm, in the future. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would say, I think that the people that are creative, I think the people that are resourceful, the people that lean into this change are going to be the ones who make it. I think that, you know, in 12 months, many of us hopefully will be back to where we were, but I think the ones that pivot, that are creative, that, that meet their customers where they need to be met may, may turn this around in six months. I think it just depends, you know, certainly on the business, but, um, you know, that, that to me has been the biggest thing that I've struggled with. You know, I have a fitness place that I go to literally almost every morning when I'm in mm-hmm. town and I miss it fiercely. So, you know, you're going to see, uh, you know, and there, there's nothing that I can do at home. There's nothing that I can do virtually that's going to, um, replace that. Um, and that's where the cares act that was, that was presented for small businesses is going to hopefully help yeah. a lot of those small business fitness studios. Um, that'll make it. And then you'll see some, you know, one of the girls that work for me just ordered a Peloton, right? You're going to see some businesses like Peloton that are probably, you know, this is serving them really oh, yeah. well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, every cir- circumstance is certainly a little bit different, but um, yeah, my heart certainly goes out to the fitness studios. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, again, as human beings, we need to move and we need to stay healthy. Um, and people crave that time together. So again, that'll be back. It'll be back. It uh, they, maybe people just add a virtual component to their offerings. So the the so the ones at home right now that are in this industry, you would kind of tell them to to try to pivot, try to learn new things, or see what else they could add to make themselves more appealing. I guess when times get better. Yeah, I mean, I think you know one of the things I'm a really big fan of is go to your core customer base and ask them what what can we do to support you right now. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and then listen and then solve for that, you know, but to me, you, you want to go ask the people who you're already serving, Hey, based on what you already loved about us, what can we do to support you now and potentially create an opportunity for us to generate some revenue and support you like the studio that I work at, if they came out with, you know, right now there's a membership fee of acts, but if they came out with a third of that fee and they're going to send me workouts every day, I'd do it in a heartbeat. They haven't done that yet, but that's to me what you want to do. But you want to go to your customers and ask them, you know, how can I help close this gap for you? Because we, none of us know how long it's going to last. And is this interesting to you? And what would you pay for it? You know, when we started our, our negotiation training company, yeah. I went to 10 of our, our kind of core clients, core customers in different verticals and different businesses and said, based on all of the content that we have, what would be the most interesting to you? And how many people would you want, you know, to participate in that in your organization? And what would you pay? And how long would you want it to be? And what would you want the behavior change to look like? And all of that. And we just took all that information in, listen, and then we built a product to close that gap. And, you know, I remember Arthur Blank told me who owns the Atlanta Falcons. I interviewed him for one of my books and Arthur said, you know, look, Molly, when you can close the gap in the marketplace and serve people, yeah, you're probably going to make it and, and whatever you're offering is probably going to work. And so that's kind of what I've always tried to do, but I think you've got to really listen to your customers first. And you've spoken to a lot of uh, huge companies. You've negotiated deals on behalf of very big and popular names, right? Such as John Smoltz, Aaron Andrews, Doc Rivers, known as the female Jerry Maguire. Um, has this problem that's going on now, like you've done quite a lot of things that weren't easy that not that many people have done. You were one of the only few uh, female agents. And sure. are these problems bigger right now than those ever were? Or would you say you, you were prepped for this through going everything you went through? Oh, well, you know, well, first I would say, I mean, they're apples and oranges, right? I mean, when you're trying to take a millionaire and make him a multimillionaire, that's not a very big problem, right? I mean, let's, you know what I mean? I mean, we've got people dying, you know, we've got businesses going under, we've got entrepreneurs suffering, you know, we have, you know, doctors and nurses on the front lines, uh, you know, compromising their own health and their family's health in significant ways. Um, 
So I don't even think it's even fair to begin for me to compare yeah. <laughs> trying to get Smoltz 100 million versus, you know, 50 million uh, compared to the challenge that our country is facing right now, human beings are facing uh, that are so real. I mean, I, I just, my heart, you know, I, I think about underprivileged kids and families and not healthy home environments um, where their best meal was at school. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not happening. And so that is, that's what I'm waking up every day and worrying about. I mean, that, that to me is, is what matters. And I think when you think about the environment that we're in, I mean, and you think about great teams, you know, I think about, you know, the Spurs, or I think about, you know, some of the best Michigan state basketball teams that yeah. coach Izzo has coached, or I think about, you know, the Braves when we, when we won it all with Smoltz and Glavin and Maddox. And I think about, I think about those teams and I think, you know, I'm so proud of uh, at some levels and there's pockets that aren't great, but there's pockets that are really great. And you see what, what is just a world, not, you know, a, a community wide maybe, or a city wide or a state wide or a country wide. I mean, there's pockets that aren't healthy certainly, but of teamwork and uh, for the better of other people. And that is super cool to see. Um, you know, because we're, we're, we're turning this curve around, but it's because people are honoring uh, the more vulnerable and that's fantastic. So, and, and this is something I actually had a heated topic, top uh, talk about with my producer, my podcast producer. And it's, it's something uh -huh. very relevant because, you know, with the shelters in place and the lockdowns, yeah. you know, we're supposed to be staying home as much as possible, like not going outside just, you know, just, just for very minimally coming back in. Right. But then, um, like there's others that encourage us to go and help, like volunteer, yeah. go here, do that, do that. But then it's kind of contradicting, right? Cause one, one sure. tells you to go outside and this will help people, but then you're supposed to be at home. How do you feel yeah. about that? You know, I mean, I think we're, we're all in this really uncharted territory, right? I mean, there's yeah. things and th there's things that are, are in contracts and agreements that nobody ever anticipated this. I mean, you know, I, I, I was on a call yesterday. I mean, there's, you know, athletic directors never anticipated that there wouldn't be a football season. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the final four never, I mean, none of those contracts had in it, man, you know, and so, you know, certainly there's force majeure, but that's uh, a lot of them didn't have this specific language in it. So, um, you know, how do I feel about it? I think, you know, what, what I wish is that everybody would uh, use good judgment, you know, lead with empathy, lead with kindness lead with reason. And, and I think we can all get through it. I mean, you think about families that have divorced children that are divorced with children. There's no custody agreements probably that have, you know, some kind of social isolation right. <laughs> clause, you know, whose house are these children <laughs> supposed to be at? I mean, yeah. th th this is just two people or, uh, you know, that have to figure it out. And, and to me, as somebody who really makes a living communicating, whether it's through books or through training or through speaking, I believe so many things can be solved through solid and healthy, authentic communication. And, uh, you know, and, and that's what I guess I hope and, and, and would ask all of us to try to lean into is probably some difficult conversations, but if you lead with kindness and love and empathy, you're probably going to be able to navigate it. And, and with kind of what matters most at the heart of the conversation, um, hopefully you can solve for it. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a time that nobody uh, ha has ever, you know, no, nobody anticipated not, you know, not throwing out the first pitch for the season right now. Um, so we've all just got to lean in and be as creative and solve, solve for it as, as much as we can. And I, I know you're not negotiating, you're, you're still always negotiating in your life, but you're not negotiating contracts at the moment, correct? At, at all. Right. Right. So I, so, you know, when I think about your show, right. Um, and, and I think about the theme and I think about probably your listeners. Yeah. So I was a sports agent for about 20 years. And then um, I had written a couple books about performance because I, you know, in 20 years being around some of the best athletes and coaches and broadcasters, you start to see the way yeah. mind, the mindset of peak performers. And I started to see a significant, you know, common thread, right. Between the way Tom Izzo thought and, and John Smoltz or Doc Rivers and Billy Donovan and, and, and I, and so I put all that together in a book and then, you know, good or bad, right or wrong, you write a book and people go, Oh, well you come and talk about your book. And so I started speaking and I really felt like that actually was 
really more of my calling than being kind of in the agent space. And I felt like I was bringing something in, into that environment that was unique and different as a female. And, and I, and, and so finally, you know, after about 18 years of being a sports agent, but with the books out and the, you know, I started, I made the jump full time to, to start my own business, to start speaking. And, you know, and now I have five books out and I speak normally about 60 days a year. And, and, uh, and then we have a negotiation training business. So, you know, the one thing I would say is, you know, when I think about your show and mm -hmm. kind of boss, boss to boss is I, I wish I would have jumped sooner. I wish okay. I would have jumped and started my, my own business just a couple years before I did. I loved every minute of the work that I did. Um, but I love what I'm doing now even more. Awesome. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in my lane even more. And I feel like I'm serving people even more. And so I, I wish I would have jumped a little bit sooner than I did. And I think that jump for all of us, what you did in your own life uh, is always hard to do. But, you know, we're in an environment right now where there may be lots of people that are finding themselves going, huh, maybe that thing that I always wanted to do, now I'm going to go time. do it now. Now's the time. Now's the time, right? right. That's right. right. Totally. Totally. Why did it? Why didn't you do it sooner? Was there something holding you back, holding you in? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, mathematically, it made absolutely no sense to do it even when I did it. Um, and you know, I think too, I had I, I had started speaking a little bit when I was still an agent, um, and I started to get some traction and some momentum. So I think I was just a at some level I was being responsible, mm -hmm. um, but I could have put my hammer down on it a little bit sooner and a little bit faster. Um, but, you know, it, it changes is something that all of us, even when we study it, even when we live it, and even when we know that it can be a powerful thing, it's hard. It um, but, you know, what I saw with all my athletes and in my own life is when you step into change, when you step into tough moments, you grow and, and you get better. I mean, I saw it with my athletes and I saw it, you know, I see it all the time in my own life. And so all of this for all of us is really, really hard. But what I hope is that we, we, we all come out of this and look back in 12 months or six months or two years, whatever it might be, and say, man, that was actually one of the best things that ever happened because yeah. now I'm doing X or now I'm doing Y or now I know who I really want on my team or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, think, I think we'll all hopefully get, get some things out of this. I agree. I uh, agree a hundred percent. And you mentioned um, in your negotiation contracts, like training, all that stuff that you, all that, that you do and that you have done uh, it, just a quick thing that you talked about, but we didn't go as much into it. What would you have done differently? What would you tell someone right, right now? Like, is there a way to prep for <laughs> situations like this now? Like, would you put some kind of clause in the contracts? Like how would you even, like, I guess if you had that, an issue that someone came up to you, like, how would you uh, go about fixing it right now? You, you mean, so, so, so help me with that question again. I'm not totally clear. Uh, say that the season is not going on right now and your oh. uh, player wants to get paid, for example. Oh, got it. And yeah. you know, there's nothing in there specifically. Like right now, I heard a lot of insurance companies, right, are not paying out because there's nothing yeah. in there specifically about a virus. Yeah. It's yeah. not covered. Uh, what would you have done uh, differently going forward? And what well, I mean, someone... yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, you know, like the Major League ba Baseball contract is pretty standard, right? I mean, a lot of these contracts are pretty standard. I don't know that any of us saw this coming with the exception of Bill Gates, right, who had that TED Talk in 2015 and kind of called this. But um, I uh, – <clears throat> I mean, I think the broader your force majeures are, I think you're going to see broader force majeure language now. It's obviously going to include things like this. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, though, I think the stronger your relationships are, the easier it is to navigate these kind of moments. But with athletes, when I was an agent, I mean, there's precedent that exists. It's public. It's a little bit of a different conversation, right? Because they're probably at some level going to need to lean into the language of the agreement and lean into a precedent of how they're handling it across the board with other athletes, other coaches. It's probably driven a little bit by the league for sure, uh, by the team itself. Um, and, and every deal is different, right? The way that my golfers were paid is different from the way a big league guy's paid or the way an NFL guy's paid. I mean, with my golfers, you know, they have to play an X number of tournaments to qualify for some of their comp pack. I mean, we, even with the non-endemic deals, with the Titleist, with the 
Nike, whatever. All that um, is usually based on the number of tournaments they play. So unless they're getting their reps in, their tournaments in, you know, all that's real. But again, part of it depends on the, you know, the holistic relationship. I mean, I had lots of keynotes that had to be adjusted and, you know, sure, I probably could have said, you have to pay me in full and I don't have to speak, but that's not the right thing to do. That's not what I want to do. I want to serve these people. I want to have a longer term relationship than just a one time. So I think when, I think what I'm seeing a lot of people doing is taking the long view, taking yeah. that, you know, as Simon Sinek, who I had on my podcast, you know, the infinite game um, is the wise thing to do. But, but as leagues, as teams, as, you know, things that have a more of a public play, there's a probably a, they're leaning into precedent and they're leaning into the contracts because they, they have to, because it's not, you know, I'm talking about one keynote, one, yeah. they're talking about, 25 guys, right. Or whatever it might be. No, that that's very, very valuable. Cause it doesn't matter what industry you are. Uh, we're definitely going to be relooking every single one of our contracts and deals going forward. Well, all these things we learned from, I yeah. mean, I never thought I'd be taking off my shoes and belts <laughs> and taking my computer out of my thing. I mean, I never thought cockpits would be locked. I mean, all these moments we learn from. And so I don't know, maybe I'll start dialing into some of these futurists that are <laughs> they, you know what I mean? <laughs> that are out there and listening to them so that uh, I can better anticipate these moments. We probably Ma all will. Yeah. Molly, Molly Fletcher, the, the conspiracy guru <laughs> coming to, <laughs> coming to you soon. <laughs> but yeah, everybody tuning in, uh, be sure, be sure to check out mollyfletcher.com. There's just so much, so many goodies, so much going on there. Her books, Fearless at Work, A Winner's Guide to Negotiating, The Business of Being the Best, The Five Best Tools to Find Your Dream Career. Um, as well as their podcast. So much good to check out there. But now we are through segment one and we are on to our listeners' favorite part of the show where we get to learn a little bit more about Molly Fletcher herself. For this segment, Miro is going to take off and... Welcome to the round with no name because they're all taken. His twin, Miko, is going to take over. Oh, wow. Okay. You're going to get five seconds to All answer right. each question really quickly. Just want to get to know a little bit more about Molly Fletcher. Are you ready? I'm ready, man. All right. What is your favorite book? The Alchemist. Your favorite movie? Jerry Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. It was, be so hard, man. If you're stranded on an island, and right now you never know, you might be. What is the one item you want with you? Can't be a person. A phone. That better be a solar panel battery you got on it too. Just yeah. saying. Who is the one person you have been most nervous to meet? Uh, who's the person I've been most nervous to meet? Probably Billie Jean King. Recently, I had an opportunity to speak at an event with her. And uh, and then I had the opportunity to have lunch with her after and all that kind of stuff. But I was pretty anxious to meet her just because she, she really turned women's tennis around. And I played in college, so I'm grateful for her. How do you drink your coffee? Well, that's such an awesome question. So uh, a little bit of French vanilla cream. Uh, I use a Keurig. Sometimes you, I use a French press. A little bit of French vanilla, a little bit of stevia, and I'm good to go. Nice. We're, we're going to be sure to note that. And I will tell Miro to have one ready for you next time he sees you. And it's awesome. on him, not me. If I gave you $100 right now and you had to come back to me at the end of the day with 200 how would you do it? I'd go to the bank and draw 100 bucks. <laughs> ah, <laughs> no, cheating. Kidding. No. I'm it's... just kidding. Oh, man, that's such a good question. Um I would, if I had to turn a hundred bucks into 200, um, I would probably, uh, I would probably just go stand on a, you know, I'd go sell some of my books or something and I'd do something that I could transact pretty quickly. Um, I, I could also get, get I could get a hundred bucks on a street corner pretty fast. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm just kidding. I'm hey, kidding. Hey, I, mean, I, I would, uh, there's, I would, there's numerous ways. We don't, I don't discriminate. We don't discriminate. I, I would do, I would do, uh, I'd do a virtual keynote or something pretty quick or, or, uh, borrow like a, it from a friend if I had to. Like a post on Facebook. Hey, I'm doing this 
live event right now come in boom right yeah 50 cents right <laughs> goes to your favorite chair and, and then we could donate it and then you and i could donate it once we exactly. get the 200 exactly last but not least iphone or android iphone all right good question good question miko is out miko's out Miro is back. Molly Fletcher of mollyfletcher.com. Thanks so much for being here today during this time, during this crazy time. And this insight definitely is, is going to be very useful to a lot of people. Uh, thank you so much for sharing and for being on. And the mic is yours. If there's anything, any final thoughts you want to share? No, thanks for the work that you're doing. Congratulations to you, right? I mean, you, you leaned into some change. You leaned into some tough stuff. And now you're, you're giving back to other people in awesome ways. And so... You're an inspiration to a lot of people, which is really cool. So congrats to you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. We're looking forward to our journeys and we'll be talking again soon. Talking again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. That is all for this episode of Boss to Boss. Your next step is to visit boss2boss.com where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is boss, the number two boss.com. And remember, the time is now.